Hello, YouTube. Hello, Claudia. Thanks everyone hello. for <laughs> hello, hello. Thanks for joining us for the live stream of the recording. If you got comments, please put them into the live chat. If you're watching this live, we'll try to make it part of the show. Claudia, Claudia, are you ready to kick this off? Let's go. All right. Claudio, welcome to Talk Python to me. So happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you here. It's great to be talking to you. And this is one of those episodes that's going to be so fun because what it's going to turn out to be, I'm pretty sure, is diving into a ton of little tools. And I can tell you, just doing a little bit of research and putting together some show notes for this, like, oh, there's that thing. And oh, look, this too. Oh, I didn't know about this. So you've assembled this conglomeration of tools and techniques that you're putting under the hyper modern banner banner and i think it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about so yeah we're, we're going to have a good time looking forward indeed same now before we get into that let's talk about your story how do you get into programming and over here to python so i think one day my my dad that must have been in the 80s came back with and said, said I bought a computer and I was really excited. I imagined, you know, that there's going to be a room filled with uh, with all these machines and uh, ran down the corridor and turned out to be like some kind of keyboard uh, as it seemed to me. So there was a Commodore 64. Um, and uh, initially we just, you know, played all those great 8-bit games. And eventually I... Um, started programming a little bit in basic and i think that's kind of when uh i really uh found out how much fun this is um and you know then i think i was interested in a lot of other non-computer things for a long while i um i went to uni i, I studied law um as and, most programmers do of course yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but somehow this um, the the interest in in formal systems always stayed with me and yeah. law, especially continental law German law is uh, very much like um, a little bit like a calculus um, tracing back to ancient Rome and I got interested in 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 logic and uh, there's a, a small research community working on applying AI and logics to uh, to legal theory. And that was really my gateway drug to 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 get back into uh, into programming, really uh, logics. Um, and I think I I programmed this like a uh, a little flashcard system to help me prepare for the uh, uh, for the law exams. And, mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, yeah. Eventually, I decided. You know, I I have to. I want to get really deep into this and I started um, studying computer science and um, pretty much never never went back to law after that. So um, <laughs> I have a law degree, but they're yeah, working as a software engineer. And, it's interesting. Uh, I hadn't really thought about it with law. I do have a friend who's a lawyer and in software. So I know it's, it's it happens for sure. But thinking about the way you have to mentally sort of solve the the problems and the constraints of like legal contracts and and laws and stuff and how they apply that's it's actually kind of a similar skill to thinking through solving a computer programming problem with apis and what the yeah. computer can do and stuff right and it's such a, a human way of thinking so it's it's really interesting from an ai point of view because mm -hmm. uh, it's not the kind of really clear um logical deductions that you have but there's a lot of um everyday knowledge that you need to uh, have and um, defeasible rules. And yeah. So it's it's quite exciting. <laughs> yeah, very neat. Now, what kind of uh, code and what, what kind of stuff are you doing these days? So I've been working mostly um, on a, um, uh, in a on cybersecurity. So um, mm -hmm. working for a company for um, almost 14 years uh, that's doing cybersecurity as a service. So um, we're mo working mostly on um, C++ services or so high performance data intensive services. Uh, and um, we're using Python um, mostly for to automate the build system, testing okay. and releases, but also for prototyping. So algorithms um, uh, that's, that's like 
really handy before you implement it in a, a high performance way. So, yeah, I think Python is used frequently for that. Like, let's prototype this. And then if once we completely decide it works right, then we're going to write it in C++ or Rust. That's not the most common use of Python, but it certainly is one that people have said, oh, this is really good because you can prototype so quickly. Sometimes people just decide, and also this will just work fine for what we're doing. It's actually, it's plenty fast. Or they decide, you know, maybe not, right? Maybe they need C++, but it's still a cool use case. Yeah. Now, let's kick off our conversation with some thoughts from a former guest, Mahmoud Hashemi. He had a really interesting um, way of sort of presenting Python to people who are not deep in the Python language and said, basically, it's actually when people say Python is great for prototyping, for example, well, they might be talking about one of three things or some combination of there. It could be when people say, oh, Python is good for this or Python is like that, they might be talking about the language or they might be talking about the standard library or more and more these days, they're talking about the third party ecosystem with, I don't even know how many libraries. I got to look this up because it changes so fast. Uh, right now at the time of recording, 368,000 libraries. So when people mention Python, they often mean one or more of those different things. And we're going to talk about hyper modern Python. So I think we we should frame it a little bit in the sense of like, well, you know, what is modern about the language, or what is kind of modern about the standard library, and and obviously the ecosystem is where a lot of it's it's happening. So, from your point of view, what is what is modern Python? Before we get to hyper modern, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we um, definitely we can talk about the. The language, the standard library, the ecosystem. I'd also add the the community. I think mm, that's yes. something that really defines Python. And, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, and all that tooling that evolved uh, in the ecosystem. So, about the language, what really? Because my, you know, my story is I, I I think I got into Python. Python was it like Python two point three? Um, and I. So you, you've been through the journey. You've been through the the great split. But and I missed the, the rejoining. Uh, I, I, I pretty much missed a lot of the pain of the Python 2.3 transition. Uh, I've been busy with C++ and then came back to Python. And for me, it was just the enthusiasm of rediscovering um, all the great, like how expressive Python had become. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really get me excited about modern Python is uh, type annotations. I just find them so helpful to structure programs, to, to make APIs clear, to help me think about my code and to keep it maintainable and readable. So I use them pretty much always. And I always run MyPy in strict mode. Um, mm -hmm. Even I, I'd even use it in small uh, scripts. And it's, of course, very helpful in large systems. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know that I've, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've never gone end to end and taken a large system and completely made it 100% my pie checked, you know? Yeah. Uh, for me, I I'm with you. I absolutely love the types. And I have I use them a lot to sort of drive the, the tooling intelligence. For example, like if you've got a data access layer, you could, you could talk about what is exchanged at the boundary there so that your editors are all of a sudden super smart about autocomplete and you know, I was just doing a massive overhaul to the course, Talk, Talk Python courses website mm -hmm. and cha I changed like, it was 110 commits in this PR. It was like ridiculous. But before I checked them all in, I went through and I said, okay, you know, look for all the type warnings. Look for anything that might have become like out of sync along the way. And I, I caught like one or two things before I accepted the, or you know, merged the PR back in. So it's just, yeah, I, I absolutely think that's one of the most important additions. And they also, it's so nice how you can leverage them at runtime as well. It's not only that they allow you to check your code in a, in, in a way that doesn't require hitting every, every uh, code path, but you can, you know, you can, you can build uh, data validation on top of it and, and so many more. Things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at libraries like Pydantic and FastAPI that are, making interesting runtime use out of it. Absolutely. And speaking of modern Python, like there's the there was that proposed change to make typing more efficient 
-hmm. where it wouldn't actually import the things until it really needed it. Or I can't remember the exact pet, but it was a way to sort of delay type information imports until you're doing something like MyPy and the pedantic people and fast you know, Sebastian at Fast API is like, wait, 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 wait. I we need this. Like this is how our thing works. If you take away the actual meaning other than for verification, it's yeah, gonna be a problem. The, the stringification of the of the type yes, exactly. that, uh, that makes it really hard for uh, for these use cases. And and there's this other approach where they where they basically um, uh, lazily evaluate the the types i think mm -hmm. um to to avoid this string problem yeah i don't know if they've um i think it's still an open question of how to how to proceed this they they um we should have gotten the the uh, string types uh, already and then um yeah decided to uh, take some more time to to find a good solution for everybody yeah i think that was uh was sort of delayed. I, I can't remember the total outcome, but I think it was like, we needed to think about this more and make sure all the UK use cases are covered, right? Yeah. Cool. Okay, well, that's the language. Um, you know, one thing that we could talk about real quick that's pretty timely is this PEP. I just had Brett Cannon and Christian on mm -hmm. uh, to talk about PEP 594, removing dead batteries from the standard library, which, you know... It's pretty interesting. The idea is a lot of these libraries had been added, these core modules have been added to the standard library in like 1992. <laughs> and they they might not still be relevant. For example, CGI is not the most common way to do web apps anymore. We've got MicroWizGi and G Unicorn and all those things, right? So does that still make sense to maintain them? Yeah, I think the, the, the set of libraries to remove them was pretty... Um non-controversial yeah i agree all, they're just very very old, obsolete uh, and also basically unmaintained um and it's c python is has i think like 90 core developers and they they have like uh, i don't know a, a thousand is it a thousand six hundred uh open prs right now so it's it's very hard to um uh to maintain a huge standard library with uh, so little human resources, yeah. Um, so, I think I think that was, yeah, pretty um, pretty uh, uh, like a, a good step. What I really find interesting is is the vision behind it. Like where where do where should the the standard library go? Um, how yeah. what are the criteria in the future to to include um, libraries? For example, we I think you, uh, recently we got uh, Tomalib into the um, right. standard right. library. Yeah, to join JSON and CSV and XML and all those. Yeah, it's it's uh, it started as a as a PyPI uh, library called Tomli, and it's been adopted quickly by a lot of the tools out there. Um, and um, and now it's part of the or it will be part of the standard library. Um, so this is. For example, this is something that um, is important to solve a, a bootstrapping problem in the, the packaging ecosystem because we have Pi Project Tommel now, and um, how is going? How is Pip going to um, to pass uh, the the Pi Project Tommel file? For example, how are the other tools going to to pass it? So it's so very right. advantageous to have it uh, in the standard lib, but we probably don't want to have um, passes for every every um, file format out there. I agree. So, in fact, a lot of the ones that were removed in PEP five nine four are actually having to do with file formats. So you've got like AIFC, which is an audio format. You have audio op. You've got um, what is it like the Sun AU format? There's a bunch of bunch of things like that. So, yeah, I don't want to dive too much into that uh, because we've done a whole show on it. But I do think it's interesting to think about this as a modern, like the first step in a modernization of the standard right. library, right? Yeah. And then where it really blows open, and I think an interesting inter, inter exchange sort of uh, cross influence here is the, as I already mentioned, the 368,000 external packages that are building on a lot of the new language features that I think are, are super cool. And how much, you know, looking back, if, 
if that world existed already, how much, how, how much smaller would the standard library be, right? Like, would URLib ever have to be in there? Well, we got requests. I don't know. Maybe not. It could, it could make a lot of sense for it actually to be there, like this bootstrapping problem you talked about. But maybe it doesn't, right? Like, I think different choices would be made. But yeah, what are your thoughts on the sort of ecosystem from the like, PyPI perspective? Hmm. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> from the, so if we look at the, at the, 30, uh, the third party uh, libraries, I think mm -hmm. um, for me, modern Python is a lot about um, expressive, expressive types like address. Um, for me, it's like the best mm -hmm. example really to how to write well structured code. Um, using um, address just got um, a, a new API, which is really, really nice. And I can definitely recommend having a look at it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's become very easy to define immutable value objects, essentially, that will allow you to, to basically structure your um, domain logic. A really expressive. And that's way. interesting, yeah. Yeah, so it did get a new API. Not frozen. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was going to say that it did get a new API recently. I forgot that it it kind of inspired data classes, and then it sort of turned turned the tables on it a bit, right? And um, sort of rethought about how some of its stuff was offered as well, right? I, I love that we have data classes in the standard library because it's like a mini address that you always have at your disposal, um, even when you don't want to take on third-party dependencies, but um, it's definitely always worth looking at address it's it's very fast and uh, has a lot of features and it doesn't have this problem that you can only really update it uh, once per year yeah and that's a super interesting point you know they considered putting requests in the standard library for a while and requests is under the what is it under i can't remember the exact organization but it's under an official psf maybe it is i think it is just the psf organization now on GitHub, right? It's sort of officially Python in a sense, but they decided not to put it into the standard library, not because it didn't fit or it wasn't good enough, but because it would actually slow down the development of requests and constrain it too much. And that's sort of similar here as well, right? Adders can come out every day with new stuff and yeah. data classes yearly, right? Absolutely, yeah. I think that's an interesting aspect of like sort of modern Python as well, right? This ability to just, continually deliver new features and adapt it as needed. I also really love C Adder um, because you mentioned Pydantic uh, before. Mm. What, I, what I really like about C Adder, it has kind of a similar, um, so, so you can, you can um, serialize and deserialize um, data classes and, and adders. Um, the difference between Pydantic and C Adders is that um, it's Pydantic is in, uh, uh, uses inheritance um, mm -hmm. to give you this functionality, um, whereas C Adders with C Adders you you just have your um, pure Python classes without any they they don't need to inherit from anything. You just have right. um, you decouple the uh, serialization logic from your domain logic and. I think that brings a lot of advantages um, in structuring software. This is the right one I have on the screen here, this C-A-T-T-R-S. Right, yeah. Yeah, interesting. So you can do things like put a frozen decorator onto just a regular Python class and, hey, it's frozen. You can um, you create an instance of it and you can say unstructure and you get a dictionary. You can structure it back and tell it what type. It parses it back, which is, yeah, quite neat. Mm. yeah this one's new to me like i said we're going to go through a lot of those <laughs> a lot of those different things uh, anything else you want to like give a quick shout out to in the broader ecosystem before like we'll we'll dig into your hyper modern yeah. ones you're using as well if you haven't seen rich and httpx those are definitely some to check out um and httpx basically we talked about requests htpx mm -hmm. is uh has a very similar interface but um gives you both async and, and sync um, uh, operations. Yeah. Um, so that's that's definitely wonderful. I use HTTPX a lot, and it's really nice because it's so familiar if you know requests, but 
if you happen to find yourself doing cool async stuff, you're not stuck not doing async for one of the most important parts, which is calling services, right? Nice. So you can await doing a get or a post or whatever. Yeah, it's it's really nice. I've not 100% switched to it instead of request, but it's it's definitely one of my go-tos as well. Hmm. Cool. All right, well, so that's sort of some thoughts on modern Python and where things are going. Then you created this series, which is almost like a little mini course on how should you, from your perspective, how should you structure and build modern Python projects and what tools should you bring in? Not just should you use HTTP, HTTPX over requests, but should you use Knox for testing and things like that? I'm guessing right. you might say yes for Knox, <laughs> <laughs> given that you work on it, right? Um, so you did this article, this six part series article on it, which I'll definitely link to. But then also you created a cookie cutter template that'll allow people to jump into it. And I, I find this to be really helpful. You know, I do this sometimes with my classes. Be like, well, here's the thing we built at the end. But if you just want to create your own version of it, here's a cookie cutter to actually just create it with, you know, your settings and your values so that you don't have to go through rebuilding it from scratch. And you know, cookie cutter has been really influential in that sense, don't you think? Absolutely. I when I wrote the um, the articles, there was example code on GitHub, and I saw people uh, forking the the repository, and I was like, oh no, oh, they're all going to end up with uh, this example code that uh, displays Wikipedia articles in your console, and am I going to keep all the dependencies up to date? And like, how do I even do that? And I, I was like, no, I, I have to. To find a better way, and and cookie cutter was definitely a good way to uh, to set up a project template, and also something that was much easier for me to keep up to date. Um, so there's uh, after two years um, definitely quite a bit of drift between the article series, um, which is from January 2020, and the cookie cutter as it is today. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to keep an article or a video or a talk or whatever as a living thing that evolves as we gain more experience and stuff. But a cookie cutter template, right? Yeah. That's that's like software. It's plastic. Yeah. You can make it open source and have contributors that uh, do some work for you, which is <laughs> really uh, extremely <laughs> grateful for all the contributions I got there. Yeah, that's great. Mm. I see a bunch of contributors there. Now, First, let's start with the, the just the term hypermodern Python. What's the story with the naming here? I actually brought you now this only for those that have a camera in front of them. That this is this is hypermodern Python. So this is not <laughs> Python. This is a hypermodern a hypermodern chess game written in oh, 1995. Um, so this is where the name hypermodern really comes from. Um, you know, it's a bit, it was meant a little bit tongue in cheek. And also, um, I was very conscious that, you know, how, how is going, how's Python go, going to look like uh, two years after I've written this, uh, this article series? Um, yeah. The ecosystem evolves so quickly. Um, and uh, I decided to stick all these uh, images in the, in the blog that are basically past visions of the future. It's, I think it's called retro futurism. So they're yeah. basically all like uh, <laughs> images from the 1920s and so on about how people are in the future maybe going to fly to the opera uh, using <laughs> planes that look like little birds. Um, yeah, it's sort of a steampunk mechanical bird people are cruising yeah. along in here. It's yeah, it's uh, it's a cool picture. It's a cool idea. <laughs> so yeah, so what is hypermodern? I think basically it's just whatever. I was excited about and didn't know about beforehand. I had I had used some yeah. tools, like more the the standard tools, um, like setup tools and pip tools, and tox. And um, coming back to Python, I I thought, wow, let's let's just check out all the things that have happened and let's see um, how maybe that might solve a few of the problems that I had. Um, so. Nice. Okay. So then you, you put together the article 
-hmm. which is, you know, it's a, a serious article. It's not just a, a couple of paragraphs, right? It's, um, it's quite a six bit of writing. Articles. Yeah. Six articles and my little, uh, or maybe it was your website. It's like 11 minutes reading for this part, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. So it, it goes into pretty good detail with examples. And then you captured it in this cookie cutter because like you said that to put it into practice, that's a pretty good way. Mm -hmm. Now using cookie cutter is super easy. You know, I'm sure people have are familiar with this, but it's cookie cutter, give it the name. It asks a bunch of questions, right? right? But I think maybe the right way to explore this would be to talk about the features and the steps of the cookie cutter that it does, right? There's on the, the page for the cookie cutter GitHub repo, there's a big section that says features. And that sort of talks about the different aspects and angles and dimensions you decided to bring in and the tooling there. So how about we just go through these and sort of dive into them? I think people That's are going to discover. Yeah, yeah, I think I think people are going to just discover some cool tools here. So first of all, let's, you know, you gotta if you're gonna build something meaningful, you've got to get some libraries off PyPI. Like there's very few projects that have no dependencies that are rich these days and not just rich the package but you know feature rich so let's uh let's talk about the first one here let's okay take us through it yeah so um poetry poetry really solved the problem for me because um it was it's basically the the one tool approach uh you have one tool that um does everything for you um it will um, allow you to define metadata for your package, build the package for you so you can publish it on PyPI. It can manage environments for you, uh, install all the, all the dependencies of your project and your project itself. Um, and it can also manage the dependencies itself. So it has a, a, a resolution mechanism. Um, and it has a, a log file, which is... Um, it, for me, a really important feature because not only is it good for deploying services in a in a reproducible and deterministic way, but it's also for running the checks on your code and um, making sure that the checks run exactly the same locally on your machine in CI um, with on and on the machines of your collaborators. Yeah, the I'm not as familiar with the poetry lock file as I should be, but basically it's like pinning your versions in a requirements.txt, right? But so right. often people just write, you know, here's my requirements. I have requests or HTTPX and I have fast API and I have SQL alchemy or SQL model. And you just type those out, then you pip install dash R and you're good to go until you want to go back to an old version that might have a bug that that's the one in production. But the bug might be because it has the old library of whatever, right? And you don't know, right? So you want to be able to pin those versions. And then does the lock file also put the hashes in so they can't be fiddled with? It does, yeah. Yeah. So it has the hashes and it gives you all the, basically the, all the indirect dependencies as well. So um, much like pip compile would do from yeah. the pip tools. Uh, so, um, and that is tremendously useful. Yeah, it absolutely is. I'm a big fan of the pip tools and pip compile. Um, we'll get to yeah. that later when we when you talk. Yeah, yeah. When we get to there's a section, a whole section in the cookie cutter about it. All right. So it, it starts and, by setting you up with poetry, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I just I just say so I, I, I called poetry the the one tool approach. And there has been a lot of work in the packaging community to introduce standards. Uh, packaging standards that make it easier for the tools to to uh, interoperate mm -hmm. um, and i think this is actually a very good way to approach things in an ecosystem like pythons to um, to make it possible that you can define your package metadata for one tool like flit um, and then use poetry to build the package or pdm and so mm -hmm. many others. And there has been a lot of great work um, that has made the the packaging ecosystem more diverse. So yeah, there yeah, there was some separation of the architectures of certain um, responsibilities, right? 
Yes. So yeah. there's PEP621, which defined the metadata. Uh, there was also an attempt to, to standardize log files, which I think would be great. Um, but that uh, PEP, I've unfortunately, has been rejected for now. So I'm hoping that there will be more attempts in the future. Um, but so as great as it is to work with poetry, I definitely hope for the ecosystem to become even more diverse and more standardized uh, to really give us more flexibility and interoper interoperability. Yeah, yeah, that is great. Definitely seems like a lot of options are coming out around that these days. And then the next one here is test automation with Knox. So it's what's, your what's your relationship with Knox, by the way? Are you the maintainer or are you just a contributor? Or what I'm, is this? I'm co-maintaining Knox. Um, okay. uh, it was written by, by Thea Flowers um, and it has um, a, uh, a large maintainer team. Um, I, at the time that I wrote the article series, I was just a fan of Knox um, and I started contributing to it and I kind of ended up uh, co-maintaining it. Um, <laughs> Whoops, so, I, I'm contributing more than anyone else. Does that make me uh, more so, involved? All right, yeah, so tell us how, what the role Knox plays. In Nox, this. So Knox is a great tool. It's not just test automation. It's really, it lets you automate basically all the developer tasks you have. So okay. this might be tests. It might be the other checks you have, like linting. Um, or it could be building your documentation or you know, building wheels, if that's complicated in, in any way, you can just, um, so the, the, the great thing about Nox is that it uses, um, it uses a Python to let you define your, um, the tasks, um, rather than basically having something like a make file where you use the shell or in Tox you, you have um, an any file where you enter your commands. Right. Um, at least Tox 3, I think Tox 4 is also going to add Python configuration. Um, so um, Nox yeah. is really, so it's really inspired by Tox, uh, I think. So if you know Tox, Tox is, um, allows you to run, to run tests on multiple versions of Python Yep. Uh, and it's been around for much longer. It's a very mature tool. Um, uh, Nox is inspired by that. It also lets you um, have this matrix of Python versions or even other things. So you can, similar to Py uh, PyTest, you can parameterize your, your, your session functions um, and pass in, say, like a, a specific dependency that you want to test against in different versions. Sonox is, is, is really useful if you want to have a single entry point into your, your project maintenance, running all the tasks that you have and running cool. them the same locally uh, and on CI. Yeah, this looks great. I hadn't really explored this, this Nox file thing where you have these different tasks, like a task, you know, a task basically being a function, like so you say like tests or lint, and you can just put a session decorator on it and just say session dot install pytest, session dot run pytest, or session install flake eight and run it with the parameters. It's it's really nice and clean and it's it's way better than a shell script. I think it keeps you in Python, right? Right. Which is probably where you want to be on Python projects. And it runs on all the platforms. So I, at some point, I use make files uh, to automate these things. So the non-tox related things, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and those don't work very well on Windows. So <laughs> yes. You, you don't have this problem. Yeah, that's for sure. Cool. And then we kind of saw an example of that there, but linting with pre-commit and flake eight. Right. Tell us so about these two libraries. I love pre-commit. I actually, it wasn't in the uh, first draft of the uh, of the article series. I got some some uh, reviewers who commented on on that. I think uh, Bonnie Funschmidt from the PyTest um, project and uh, and Henrik Schlavak both mentioned that you know you have to cover pre-commit. And I was really skeptical. I had made bad experiences with these kinds of pre-commit um, hooks. That run mm -hmm. so you make a, a git commit and then 
it doesn't work because you had some wrong white space in it. Um, and I thought, mm, I want my commits to be really snappy. I'll, I'll just use Nox for that. Um, uh, but after ha hearing these comments, I thought, I'm, I'm going to give it a try. You know, like it's a new tool. Maybe it solves these problems much better. And it really does. I would, I would really recommend anybody to give a pre commit a try. Basically, you drop a, a YAML config in your project that defines the hooks that you want to run. Mm -hmm. um, so this might be a hook that formats your code using black um, or that, um, that lints um, your code using flag eight or so much more there. There's uh, an abundance of uh, pre-commit hooks out there. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's, there's probably 20 pages in the list of pre-commit hooks that are uh, at the top. You can click on supported hooks in pre-commit.com. Right. And um, pre-commit, it's, so it's a Git hook manager, but it's not just a Git hook manager. It's also a, a linter framework and a multi-language multi linter framework. So you can have your hooks written in you know, Ruby, C++, you name it. Um, and it's very easy to use them um, in a Python project or basically any, any language uh, project. Um, it works. Uh, using Git, so um, basically uh, installs the tools from their Git repository. And um, then you can, um, you can run them as part of your Git commits or all the other hook points that Git offers. Um, but you can also run it just in CI on your entire code base. And that's really what I what I love about it is that it has this this fail fail early philosophy. So you really get very early feedback, um, but it also works to as a gatekeeper for your default branch and make sure that um, the all the commits that go into your um, main branch are well formed. This is this is interesting. I I did have. Um creator of pre-commit on the show and oh, quite a while ago I talked about it um but i hadn't i think maybe some of these are new or i hadn't really appreciated them before like one that's really cool here is check json as a pre-commit and it checks json files for parsable syntax so basically as part of your commits it says well here's i'm guessing here's a changed json file is this you know can it just basically be loaded with you know json.loadf or load give it a file right and another one is, um, yes, you're supposed to have unit tests, but you might not have unit tests for everything. So check AST just means like, can Python parse the files? That's sort of like the, the compile step, right? right. In a sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are just like the first couple out of this 20 pages. So um, I need to come back to this and you know, check TOML is another sort of similar to the check JSON, check YAML, check XML and so on. Yes, there's a, this repository called pre-commit hooks and that has uh, lots of very small hooks that are uh, tremendously useful. And then you have larger tools that also offer integration with pre-commit, like Flake 8, for example. Right, right, nice. All right, and then on to continuous integration. Um, I feel like GitHub Actions has really sort of taken hold in the Python space as a way a lot of people are doing stuff there. Absolutely, it feels like there was some kind of mass exodus from Travis CI to to GitHub Actions, um, it's so uh, flexible um, and it goes way beyond uh, just running tests and like the, the, the normal, what you normally think of as uh, CI. So you can um, automate a lot of your developer workflows uh, centered around the collaboration with others. Um, so nice. The type of stuff I work on doesn't super lend itself well to github actions it does uh, yeah it probably does somewhat but uh, it's not something i use that much but it seems like if you had a, a package that had maybe complicated builds or something like that you could even use it to build your wheels and stuff like that right sure yeah i mean my the way i like to use it um is to have most of the logic in nox because that means i can always just test it locally and see right. if everything 
you know, debug it easily. And then I try to keep the GitHub Actions workflows pretty lightweight and just let them invoke Nox. I usually have a, a, a matrix um, with that contains the Nox sessions. So this might be the testing or running pre-commit or to, to, to lint the code or to build the documentation, see if, if that, uh, that's all valid. And then um, in, in the matrix has the Python versions that I want to test on. If I'm yeah. working on a library, yeah. it's important to support not just the latest Python version, but probably Python 3.6 onwards, maybe even the, uh, the upcoming Python version. And then yeah. obviously platforms. So always, um, uh, if you're unless you're you're we're only working on one platform, try to to have at least Linux and and Windows, and then maybe maybe macOS as well. Yeah, yeah. This is neat. You know, people talk about well, we can't really test this on Windows because I don't have a Windows machine, or vice versa. Can't test it on Mac or so easy. Yeah. So <laughs> this easy. here's your three platforms right here, right? I'm not saying it's easy to debug it if something goes wrong and you're only working on macOS or Linux. And <laughs> you probably at some point want to have a virtual machine running Windows if you don't have a, a physical Windows yeah. machine. But it's also not hard to get one these days too. But otherwise, you know, it's very easy to integrate Windows in your CI. Nice. Yeah, very cool. And then the next one has to do with documentation here. Um, Sphinx, right, yes. missed and read the docs <laughs> and um, one of the themes so yeah, yeah. pretty uh, when i wrote the the articles um it was just sphinx and read the docs mm -hmm. um, missed hadn't happened yet so well missed that, maybe let's start with sphinx uh because I guess many people will already be familiar with it it's a python documentation generator it's also used for python's own uh, documentation so for example the library docs um, it's been a long, around for a long time and it normally uses a restructured text which is a very expressive language to write uh, technical documentation sometimes too expressive <laughs> sometimes too expressive <laughs> right. it's not the lightweight language that uh, we know uh, markdown to be right and markdown is really conquered the world um, and when I, when I wrote the documentation chapter I think I linked to uh, an article by Eric Holcher uh, mm -hmm. from read the docs comparing the two formats and there was before before mist happened and um, he said you know there's the use restructured text it's just so much more expressive and it lets you have cross references and all of mm -hmm. these things as the right. powerful directives. Um, anyway, now we have MIST, and MIST allows you to do essentially the same thing in Markdown. Um, there's a, an extension syntax, and um, mm -hmm. you can have directives, you can have cross-references, and it's a lot of fun to write uh, documentation in, in MIST. So this was a, a recent addition to, to the project template um, to support yeah, um, Markdown documentation. And for those who don't know, I also I did have a show uh, recently with the Miss folks and about Sphinx and Miss and so on. And there I learned that one of the things that's cool is you can inline restructure text. So if you get to a section, you're like, ah, this is just marked down. I want to do this. No, do a little tiny bit of restructured text instead right. of living in it, you, you know, actually, for always. You actually need to do that still for your um, generated API documentation. So Sphinx has okay. this. Uh, extension called Autodoc that will take all the right. doc strings in your code and transform that into API um, documentation. And that still doesn't have a replacement. Uh, so what you do is um, you write your doc strings, you know, using restructured text, maybe using Google Google style doc, doc strings or NumPy style doc strings, and um, then you use the autodoc directive to uh, basically quote it in line in the um, in your markdown documentation so that's a little bit of restructured text there 
I okay. think they're working on filling this gap. There's some some work going on, and I'm really looking forward to to that feature uh, coming because then everything will be just marked down. Yeah, that'll be great for sure. I do want to give a quick shout out to Paul Everett's course that he wrote over at Talk Python on Sphinx. It's, if you're interested, check out this this free course that he put together for us over there. So that's worth checking out. Now um, I'll put a link in the show notes. Now, um, if you're building a Python package that goes on PyPI, like not everything people build with Python goes on PyPI or, or even right. should be structured in the shape of a package potentially. But a lot of them are, right? A lot of libraries are. So you talk about automating, up, uh, automating uploads to PyPI and test PyPI. Want to talk about the, the story there? Yeah, so PyPI, the Python package index there actually has a, a sibling called test PyPI, which is just a separate instance. Um, it's very useful to um, upload your wheels and SDIS to test PyPI hmm. before you actually do a release because you can check them and see if everything is the way you expect it to be. Um, yeah. install, basically install the package end-to-end. -end. Um, and in CI, what I like to do is I have the switch where if it's a, a, an actual release, I upload to PyPI, but in all the other cases, I just upload to test PyPI. So every commit that goes into the main branch is um, going to be built and uploaded to test PyPI. Yeah, you you can't change what you put into PyPI. You can add new versions that replace it, but you can't change a version, really. The best you can do is yank the release. Uh, yeah. It's still going to be there uh, for those have, who have pinned the version, but uh, otherwise it's... It will be invisible to those who just want to get the latest release. But yeah, yeah so no it's a, replacing. Yeah, so it's a nice reminder and automation to set up to to remember there's test PyPI and automatically sort of have your project know and use it. All right, here's another one. When I talked about stuff I was learning, this one is definitely new to me, and this is cool. Um, automate release notes with release drafter. Tell us about release drafter. This is cool. So release drafter takes the titles of your merged PRs and it, it creates um, a draft release. So the um, release in this sense is the GitHub release. That is something that you can see on the right-hand side of the, of the GitHub repo page. Um, you have this uh, releases link and mm -hmm. that basically gets you to Either a list of tags, or you can, you know, describe the describe the changes. So it's essentially release notes on GitHub. Um, release Surely notes. there's some kind of weird inception where release drafter uses release drafter to build its change logs or something. I'm guessing, right? <laughs> I'm <laughs> Probably. Sure they do. So release drafter is really handy for that. Um, now, actually, you can so GitHub release. GitHub releases have an auto generate button. So some of this functionality you will actually get even without using the release drafter action. So the it I think the release drafter action is uh, somewhat more um, flexible what it gives you mm -hmm. and basically means you're going to have to add a GitHub actions workflow for it and the configuration file and you can provide a template um, for your release notes and some, you know, replacement marker that a placeholder that that uh, where all the um, the PR titles go. This thing is cool, and it even has a draft. Like you, you can see the draft release notes as well. Right. Yeah, you can see it, and then you have a button to publish the the draft release and. If you don't have a tag yet, that's also going to add a Git tag to your repository. Cool. So that's a really, oh yeah, that's really nice. Lightweight, lightweight approach um, to the release notes question. So I see that it has a what's changed, but I also saw in the release drafter it had like bug fixes and stuff. Is there a way to teach it? Like these PRs are related to bugs, and these are additions yes. and stuff like that. Yes, you'd. Uh, you can do that using labels on your PR. So if it's a bug fix okay. and you have Got a it. fixed label, 
you know, that then you can put it under a separate section. Cool. So basically just drive it with GitHub labels. Cool. All right. Uh, we got a lot to go through here. So maybe these next two are pretty quick here. Um, actually, next three here. You talked about this sort of article and the cookie cutter drifting quite a bit apart because so many things have changed. One thing that seems to be pretty stable is like since Black came out, people are all about just Black. <laughs> it hasn't seemed to have gone out of style at all. I think that's it pretty is, pretty stable one, right? It really makes a huge difference for productivity. And I feel if I'm contributing to somebody else's project, it makes things so much easier to know that there's a consistent style. I, I don't need to be afraid to destroy uh, somebody's you know, well-crafted, handcrafted, um, formatted code. Um, I can just run black. And it's also a great, really helps uh, readability. It's basically the style becomes invisible. So I love black. And black now yeah. has uh, left its uh, better status in January. So we now have... Um, uh, Official it's black. Like, finally. <laughs> waited. Well, known as hash zero, 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 zero. There's no more debate. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, I'm definitely, uh, definitely a big fan of black. Um, Indeed. I also give a shout out to Predir as well. And then sort of related, you have import sorting with iSort. So I, I've been using reorder Python imports for a long time, which uh, is also a tool by Anthony Sotile, who wrote uh, Precommit. Um, yes, I wanted to give Anthony a shout out, but I, was, I wasn't 100% sure that I had the name just right in my memory, so I didn't want to like misattribute it. But yeah, he also did Precommit, which I had him on the show for. Right, so, so um, these days uh, I actually like to use iSort, which is uh, what everybody uses. Um, it's since iSort 5, it, it, it's become much nicer to use. It uses the AST more. It uh, has no trouble figuring out what your third-party dependencies are. And um, it has a, an option. So it has, uh, it has these profiles to make it really easy to be compatible with black uh, style. And what I like to do is I, I like to put each commit, uh, sorry, each import on a single line, uh, which is actually what reorder Python imports does as well. And it greatly reduces the chance of merge conflicts. So, Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah of course. Sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. A uh, quick question, just stepping back to um, the release drafter. Michael out in the audience says, you know, his biggest hurdle is for doing regular and good release for doing regular and good releases are change logs. Is how does release drafter sort of fit into that? Is you know, right. Basically, so, if you structure everything as a PR, it'll capture it. Yes. Uh, so release drafter only drafts the GitHub release for you. If you want to have, um, say, a uh, a page in your Sphinx documentation you're going to need to pull that out. There's actually, a, a, I think, um, uh, Evi Joachim wrote a, um, sorry, I, no, that's his GitHub handle. I, I'm <laughs> sure we, we should put a, a link later, but there's a tool that, uh, that will pull the GitHub release and insert it into your Sphinx documentation. So you can do that. Um, there's also Town Crier, which really should be mentioned, and Scriv, uh, which was written by Ned Batchelder. Uh, those are tools that allow you to have re add release notes to your PRs as snippets or fragments. Um, and that scales very well if you have a, a, an open source project with many contributors. Um, so, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Still figuring out the best way to um, maybe... Um, integrate all of these in some way but yeah sure you can overdo it for sure all right uh, i think a quick just a quick shout out speaking of ned batch elder we have pytest coverage.py and codecov all in there is mm -hmm. um is, is neat and then cli interface with click so that's a that's an interesting one a popular one as well absolutely so that's from the, the palace project so the same family of projects like flask there's also a nice wrapper for click called Typer. Um, yes. Written by the Fast API uh, author. Um, yeah, when I saw that you're using click, I'm like, hmm, you're such a fan of types. Maybe Typer is also relevant here. I've actually, <laughs> I just had another look at Typer, and I think I do like it after all. I, I actually really like it. Um, 
I was initially I was like, well, it's actually not so. Uh, I, I kind of like how Click gives you these decorators and separates mm -hmm. the um, your option help texts from the actual function. But it is true that typer re really reduces uh, duplication um, because you you don't you don't have to repeat the types of your options. You know, you they're just they're just the type annotations of your parameters. So that's really neat. Nice. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. So. Continuing with the typing story, we've got two things here. A static type checking with MyPy. I suspect a lot of people who are really into typing know about this. Like the CLI you run against your code and it'll make sure everything hangs together. If this function is calling that function with that variable, and you said that variable is one of the things, it makes sure that all, all is going to fit together. Um, if, and if you get that working, then you might be open to having something like MyPyC for optimizations and so on, which is also interesting. But one that maybe people haven't heard about is runtime type checking with TypeGuard. Right. I think it's really one of the most undervalued um, projects out there in the, in the typing space. TypeGuard is so useful. Um, when I first heard about it, I was like, why would you want to runtime type check your code if you have a static type checker? You know, the, mm. why then you, you, you need to hit all the code paths. Uh, type static type checking is great because it can just basically uh, deduce uh, the type correctness. Type guard is really useful if you're, for example, if you're interfacing with um, third party libraries who may or may not have type annotations. If they do, great, but you, you know, how much do you trust them? Um, right. Yeah. Just because it says it, nothing enforces that where it said it returns an int, it could return none. And it should have said and optional end, but it didn't. Your code can absolutely be uh, have type correctness as far as MyPy is concerned, but that might be just because there are some any types or it's just kind of a loosely type because there's no way to to be stricter about the, the actual types. And TypeGuard will check that. So the way I like to use TypeGuard is as a PyTest plugin. So you're basically running your, your uh, test suite. And if you have... Um, complete code coverage that should give you a good a good chance to to catch any oh interesting so you can turn it on while your tests are running and it will runtime check everything but then in production not turn it on exactly okay uh, so you you basically specify it um so you install it next to to pytest and then you pass an option i think it's type guard packages and pass the, the name of your package. And then um, TypeGuard is going to, uh, um, well, in, wrap every function in your code and uh, check the, the parameter types and the return type. So that's really useful. It's also a library. So if you want to explicitly check in production, you can also use TypeGuard for that. Nice. Yeah, it's got the type checked decorator, which probably you can just put that on stuff that you want to make sure it's checked. Nice. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's a good one to learn. Another one is, you know, um, you, you create your project, you start building it two years later, who knows, some feature is added. Some other language feature might be not the way to do things. So you talk about automated Python syntax upgrades with pi up upgrade. Um, yeah, this yeah, is cool. It's another uh, Anthony Sotile tool. So it's uh, it also, you can run it from pre-commit. Um, it's going to um, essentially pass the, the AST of your, uh, so the abstract syntax tree of your, of your code and look for things that have better ways to, uh, to express them in your versions of Python. So basically right. what you say you drop Python 3.6 um, and automatically uh, you get um, unions um, like the pipe. pipe right, unions. right. Like int pipe know. none versus optional bracket int, something like right. that, right? Yeah. These kinds of things are, yeah, giving you nice uh, set comprehensions. Yeah. Instead of like calls to the set built in. Lots of these, and it's 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 very nice if you're supporting multiple Python versions, and you've been waiting to use this feature, and now finally you can drop the 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 last uh, Python version that didn't support it, and 
you get this for free. I just that is, run yeah, that is interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. You know, some of these are not language features in the sense that people are thinking, oh, well, now I can use async and await, which would take like a real important, significant change. But it's just like, oh, you, you know, now you're able to, because of pep, 289 pass a generator directly to the min function or max or sum rather than a list comprehension, which then gets processed, right? And that would just be more efficient across the board. And so that just happens automatically, right? right. Cool. Yeah, very neat one. All right, next, um, security audits. So there's, um, there's Bandit. Um, Bandit is a tool that looks at your Python code and figures out if there are any things that may or may not um, give you a security vulnerability or I guess any kind of security issue. It flags some some things like just importing a sub process, and you can uh, no QA it. Um, I still find that useful. Uh, because it just gives me a moment to think about uh, <laughs> right. all the implications of uh, uh, spawning um, other processes from our Python code, uh, and but it it has a, a lot of a lot of uh, checks um, in your in your Python code base, so uh, it's, it's very nice to um, use it to guard yourself against some. Right, like it'll process. detect things like YAML dot load should be YAML dot safe load and. Right. I bet there's something there about pickling. <laughs> yeah, not? for sure. There's <laughs> gotta be. <laughs> All right, well, and safety. then yeah, exactly. Safety is the other one. Yeah, the, that that basically just checks your dependencies. So there's a there's a curated database of security vulnerabilities, and it's gonna um, see if you have any dependency in a version that was vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, just uh, stepping back just a moment. Uh, Nick Ma points out that Typer is amazing when it comes to the documentation in the dash dash help option, which is yeah, pretty cool. Uh, let's see, going back to, yeah, checking the documentation with X doc test. So X doc test is essentially a rewrite of a, a standard um, library or utility. It's called doc test. Um, and what does it do? Uh, so suppose you have a doc string with an example code that shows how you um, how you are supposed to use a library or a function, um, and you commonly write these with a the, um, the Python interpreter prompt um, to uh, give you like what what does the user type uh, like import my package and then right. underneath uh, you have the output of um, whatever you know functions you called and so on. Um, and so doc test um, runs these examples and sees if uh, they produce the expected output, they don't throw uh, raise exceptions and so on. X doc test is a rewrite that uses the AST more than regular expressions, uh, which is nice and is also a bit more flexible. Um, so, um, and has a few nice features um, compared to doc test. All right, cool. So if you have an example in your documentation here's a way to automatically make sure it's it's all good uh also another audience question follow up here basil asks what do you think about services like sync uh, sneak sorry s-n-y-k sneak to um check dependencies uh, like for security right so you depend on flask flask depends on it's dangerous it's dangerous who knows theoretically could have some issue like that kind of check I'm thinking he's asking for. I haven't used Snick yet, so I'm only I'm only um, familiar with uh, with safety. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Cool. Uh, getting close to the end. <laughs> then I have a question about all of these taken as a whole. All right, generating API documentation with Autodoc and Napoleon. Right, so we talked about this uh, before. So this takes it takes your doc strings and generates API documentation. Right, and this is not a RESTful API, like Swagger Open API. No. This is this no. is like my Python libraries function documentation, right. right? Exactly. Yeah, that's so the reference for your the functions in your in your package. Got it. Classes. Right. 
And Napoleon is um, a, a tool that will add support for doc strings that are written Google style, for example, or some other um, some other conventions for doc strings. So Google style is pretty lightweight. Which yeah, I'm a fan style, of that as well. Um, yeah. yeah, declaring your arguments and 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 returns. Okay, nice. Generate a command line reference with Sphinx click. So I'm guessing if you've if you were using click, <laughs> this might be relevant. Right. So you already have all your option help texts and um, you know command descriptions in in click. So why not just use them to generate the documentation? And that's basically what Sphinx click does. So it takes. So if you when you when you build your documentation and you use things like Autodoc or Sphinx Click, you have to remember to install your own package. And then these tools can just import it and um, and, and read the um, read all the documentation that you have inline in your code, including click uh, yeah. option subtext. Yeah, very cool. All right, you've done all the work, you've documented it, you've tested it, it's good to go. Now you're going to release it, put it on GitHub. And the last one is manage project labels with GitHub Labeler. So the, the idea of Labeler is that you, instead of going through the web interface and then typing in all the uh, color codes in hex and so on, you, um, you can just use a, a file that you put in your repository to, to, um, to manage all your all your labels for your PRs and for your okay. issues, so that's uh, that's really helpful, and makes it really easy if you're collaborating with other people. Nice, yeah, that looks great. Okay, well, that's that's your cookie cutter, and in one fail swoop, in one single CLI cookie cutter command, you get all of these. Uh, is so when this runs, um, I should have just run it and, and played with it, but does it give you an a option to say, you know, uh, don't install my pie or does it just kind of give it all to you? What's the, I know cookie cutter has a lot of conditional behaviors mm -hmm. and stuff. Like what's the experience of using this to create a project? I have personally resisted uh, putting in too many options. Um, it's kind of, I, I try to find, to kind of show one way that works and also, keep it maintainable so i don't have a lot of um i don't want the combinatorial explosion there's a, a little bit of um, options uh, that it gives you so you can choose the license for example and cookie cutter allows you to you know um, hide or show parts of your file tree depending on uh, what the user chose mm -hmm. but basically it's not meant to be the all the different packaging tools, all the different ways like Tox, Nox, um, the different CIs, um, that uh, there was a conscious decision to basically say, okay, here, here's one way to do it. And I can really curate it and make sure that it all works. Um, sure. Keep it opinionated and straightforward and, and whatnot, right? And I suppose if people really wanted to use Tox instead of Nox and they wanted to use Typer instead of Click, they could fork the repo, create their own template, right? And, and roll with that. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, very interesting. Uh, quick, one, one more quick audience question here from Michael says, can Labeler, as in GitHub Labeler, export existing settings? It'd be great to unify labels across repos. Any idea? Right. I think there is a separate tool to do that. So I don't think that GitHub Labeler does it, but I remember that that was actually a community uh, contribution. And I remember that the contributor who, who added this feature um, first went and, and uh, exported the existing configuration from whatever we had in the repository. Okay, yeah, cool. So, Yeah, very nice. All right, well, we are just just a tiny bit out of time here. So uh, unfortunately, even though there's a bunch of other stuff I wanted to cover, I don't think we're going to be able to because we covered so many cool things. You know, I did want to just give a quick shout out to your music. And in addition to being a lawyer and a software developer and open source person, you also do like compositional stuff, right? So you've got on your website, you got a whole section, I don't know how many videos here, like 10, 10 different music videos that you've 
put together the, you know, a uh, pretty neat. You want to just give a quick shout out to that? Yeah. So I, I spent, I spent, I think, 10 years uh, working both as a software engineer and a, and a touring and, and recording musician, uh, also as a ra arranger. So I arranged some string quartets. And um, so the, um, I did arrangements for, for Naima Husseini, who is a, a German um, indie uh, singer. Um, definitely check her out. Ja mm -hmm. Jackie, I've been on tour with her really across uh, all of Europe and um, wonderful um, reggae-inspired uh, singer. And there are mm -hmm. so many more. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. very grateful for all the musicians I've been able to, to, to play with. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I listened to a bunch of them. My favorite is Immer, Immer Alles, Akustisch im Deutschen Theater. The, that's the one with Naomi Husseini. She, right. That was a really good one. Uh, they're all good, but that one was uh, really excellent. And then uh, Michael also thinks that we should have a whole podcast about your compositional tools. Quickly, <laughs> do you use Python for any of this stuff, or is it is it kind of a separate world? I, sadly, it's pretty much a, separ a separate world. I, I've been using Ableton uh, a lot. And right on. I didn't really get into automating all of this with Python <laughs> yet. Maybe not one. yet. Not yet. Also, I, I think Lukas right. Langer does this uh, kind of stuff. So yeah. So yeah. Cool. It can be done. Yeah. People should check out Fox Dot. Are you familiar with Fox Dot and that that whole programming with Py um, composition, sort of building up music with Python? Have you seen this? I know. I, oh my gosh. I. I gotta check every time out. I search for it, Fox Dot. I think it's Fox Dot Python. I think that's what it is. Um, if you check out the videos, yeah, there's, there's some, some neat live coding music with Fox dot and Python. I, I, every time I just randomly pick one of these videos, it's not really necessarily the best one, but there's some really neat ones of sort of like adding instruments in with Python. It's, it's cool. People can check that out. Yeah. All right. Well, we are out of time, Claudio, really quickly. Final two questions. If you're going to write some Python code, what editor are you using these days? Um, I use SpaceMax, been using Emacs for a long time and uh, use it with VI bindings now. I like it. Right on. And I'm almost hesitant to ask you for a notable PyPI package because we covered so many, but maybe just like, I, you know, what one stands out to you? Like you want to just give a shout out to either one we covered or a different one. I think I just, I just name uh, TypeGuard because it really deserves uh, TypeGuard. TypeGuard 3 is going to come out hopefully soon, bringing new features. So. Cool. All right. Well, final call to action. People want to get started um, with this hypermodern project idea that you've created. What do they do? Uh, so just go to the um, cookie cutter hypermodern Python repo. Um, check out the contributor guide and the code of conduct. And we love contributors. So, uh, I know. so all, how, how relevant is going back and reading the article? Is it has it drifted too far or is it enough to get like some of the Zen? I or would, if you've listened I, to this, are you kind of good to go? I, I think the, the article series is still fun to read. Um, I think these days um, what I would recommend is that you don't just take the example code. Um, maybe just generate a default uh, project from the cookie cutter and then take a look at that as well because some things have changed uh, in the two years. But uh, the article series kind of gives you the motivation for everything and uh, it's probably also more fun to read than the user guide for the project template, which is also there and very yeah. detailed, but uh, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. All right, well, thank you so much for being on the show and congrats on the cool project. Thank you very much. You bet, bye. Bye-bye.